Hey, welcome everyone to UNICEF's webinar on setting up and implementing institutional policies to combat gender-based violence in academia, the 7P framework by UNICEF. My name is Vasya Madesi and I'm working as a consultant for Yellow Window. And today's webinar will be delivered with my colleague Panayota Polikarpu, also from uh, Yellow Window. So, uh, today we are launching this series of webinars. Uh, the topic will be delivered in a series of three, as shown in this uh, table. The next two webinars will be delivered on the 25th of April and the 2nd of May. So if you haven't registered, please do so as the topics uh, will be different and we will advance on the seven piece framework. Starting with the learning objectives, by the end of the three webinars, you will have gained understanding of uh, concepts related to gender-based violence and understand its impact in academia. You will also be familiar with the seven P's model of UNICEF, which represents a holistic approach to tackle gender-based violence in research performing organizations through the seven P's, which we will discuss in detail throughout the three webinars, starting of course today. Most importantly, uh, you will get inspired by good practices presented at the end of each session by our guest speakers. Before we start, we would like to give the floor to Colette Schredel from the European Science Foundation, the coordinators of the UNICEF project, for a brief presentation of the project. Good morning. Okay, so good morning. So I'm Colette Schrodi from the European Science Foundation. And for those of you who are not yet familiar with UNICEF, I'm just going to go through a brief presentation of the project to provide you an overview of what the project is about and what we have been um, issuing these past, these past months. So UNICEF is a three-month, three-year project that will end in January 2024. So it's about gender-based violence and institutional responses building a knowledge base and operational tools to make universities and research organizations safe. The project is structured in eight work packages and involves a consortium of nine partners. So the, the objectives are to generate knowledge and to produce tools and recommendations within a nutshell. So basically we try to we have tried for the at the beginning of uh, the in the first stage we tried to understand the context the context, sorry, to identifying gaps in previous studies and existing data on gender-based violence and mapping existing national policies and legal frameworks. We've also collected evidence on gender-based violence, analysing quantitative and qualitative evidence of gender-based violence in research organisations and universities, the determinants and the consequences, and also the efficiency of institutional measures to combat gender-based violence. These findings have then been translated into, are being translated into concrete policy recommendations, tailored tools and capacity building activities to support stakeholders in eradicating gender-based violence. And in the last stage, we'll, we're in empowering research organisations and universities to actually implement these policies through capacity building programmes and using a co-creation approach of the tools. So, we, um, with UNICEF, regarding the research, UNICEF researchers have analysed pr the prevalence and impacts of gender-based violence through, um, so data has been gath gathered through a very wild, um, large-scale survey among 42,000 staff and students in 45 research performing organisations in 15 different countries. So we will, with that, within this research, we've been looking at the micro level. On a meso level, we've been looking at the organizational responses and infrastructures by gathering data uh, through in-depth case studies, interviews, and also a strategic, map a strategic mapping of institutional policy responses in 15 member states. On a macro level, we've been looking at the legal and policy frameworks by extensively mapping um, um, policy frameworks in 27 European states and three associated states. 
This has led to a um, certain number of outputs that you that are available uh, on the project website under the output section. So you'll, you can find there the, the conceptual framework of UNICEF that we'll be presenting a little here. And you'll also find the key results from the UNICEF survey, which pro provide interesting information about uh, the prevalence of uh, gender-based violence in Europe. And this data has been analysed and uh, synthesised in a multi-level uh, analysis of the survey data. So, in a, in a report that you'll, you, it's also available. Um, you can also read a summary of the ana of the analysis we led uh, through interviews with researchers, and also the case studies of institutional responses, and um, a policy brief on the project findings. I was talking, referring to the policy mapping, you can find a map um, um, that uh, summarises all the, the findings related to the national context map, the mapping of the national context, the institutional policies and the European baseline. We'll soon have white papers coming um, that will soon be released and recommendations, specific recommendations to policy makers, RPO management, RFOs and a second policy brief. And we'll also be releasing a toolbox by the end of the year for universities and research organisations, which include an assessment framework for institutional responses to gender-based violence, and also capacity building tools that are in the, make, uh, in the make, making. So and this is also includes a uh, step-by-step guidance to set up awareness raising campaign that you might want to take a look at um, on, also on the website. So this is a, just a very broad overview of what we've been doing up until uh, up until now before to, to pass the floor to, to Pam. I'd also like to mention that during this webinar you can also um, connect and engage on social media with us on the Twitter account in the safe GB. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Colette. So let's kick off our uh, webinar. Uh, give me a second to make sure that you can see my screen. So uh, without further ado, let's start with a brief introduction to gender-based violence. So according to the Council of Europe, gender-based violence refers to any type of harm that is perpetrated against a person or a group of people because of their uh, functional or perceived sex, gender, sexual orientation, and or gender identity. Gender-based violence can take different forms, such as sexual, physical, verbal, psychological, or socioeconomic violence, and it can be expressed in different forms, from verbal violence and hate speech on the internet to rape or murder, and can take place both offline and online. Similarly, it can be perpetrated by anyone, a current or former spouse or partner, a family member, a colleague uh, from work, schoolmates, friends, or unknown person or people who act on behalf of culture, religious state or interstate institutions. As illustrated by this iceberg, this figure is a metaphorical representation of the different levels of violence that exist in society. The iceberg represents the visible and invisible aspects of violence. Beneath the surface, there are many other forms of violence that are less visible, but can be just as damaging. This includes psychological violence, such as threats, intimidation, and emotional abuse, as well as systemic violence, such as discrimination and exclusion or use of uh, sexist la language, among others. So these forms of violence are often overlooked or dismissed, but they can have a profound impact on individuals and society as a whole. Now, according to UNICEF's understanding of gender-based violence, gender-based violence capture all forms in both online and offline context. In addition, UNICEF acknowledges that violence intersects with other dimensions of inequalities such as age, ethnicity, disability, and sexuality. Therefore, it takes an intersectional approach, which we will also discuss later. So gender-based violence encompasses, but it's not limited to the types of violence that you see on the right column. As previously mentioned by Colette, between January and May 2022, 
UNICEF service, UNICEF survey team coordinated the implementation of an online survey with over 20, uh, well, 42, excuse me, thousand responses from staff and students. And the survey is the largest uh, cross-cultural survey reported in research performing organizations. What is more important, of course, is the results of the survey regarding gender-based violence in academia and research institutions, which we will take a look now. Results show that 62% of the survey respondents have experienced at least one form of gender-based violence since they started working or studying at their institution. Respondents who identify as LGBTQ uh, plus, those who reported a disability or chronic illness and those belonging to an ethnic minority group were more likely to have experienced at least one incident of gender-based violence compared to those who do not identify with these characteristics. Almost one in three students and staff say that they have experienced sexual harassment within their institution. And psychological violence is reported as the most prevalent form of violence with a, a, a 57 percentage, where 6% of respondents have experienced physical violence and 3% uh, sexual violence. What's more alarming, is that among the respondents who have experienced uh, gender-based violence, only 13% reported it. And here comes the question, why? Why such low reporting rates? Among the reasons for no reporting events of gender-based violence, almost half of the victims said that they felt uncertain whether the behavior was serious enough to report it. And another frequent reason for, for not reporting was that victims do not always recognize the behavior as violence at the time of the incidents. Now, if we look a bit closer at the impact and consequences of experiences of gender-based violence in the context of academia, the survey results show that for staff, such experiences have led to dissatisfaction with their job, uh, experience, they experience reduced work productivity and consider leaving the sector, and these were the most common responses among others, while for students, experiences of gender-based violence had led to mostly missing classes, dissatisfaction with the course of studies, and reduced learning achievements, again, as the most common responses amongst, among the rest you see in the table. Now, as previously mentioned, gender-based violence is rooted in the social and culture structures and norms and values that govern higher education and society in general, and is often perpetrated by a culture of denial and silence. So gender-based violence is based on an imbalance of power and is carried out with the intention to humiliate and make a person or group of people uh, feel inferior. Now, looking into the concept uh, of intersectionality, I'm sorry, uh, looking into the uh, uh, concept of uh, intersectionality and gender-based violence that was previously mentioned. Uh, intersectionality is a concept that describes how different social identities, such as gender, race, ethnicity, uh, class, sexual orientation, and ability intersect and interact with one another to, sh to shape individuals' experiences and social structures. Intersectionality recognizes that that recognizes that these identities are not separate and dependent, but they're interconnected and affect each other in complex ways. Now, in the context of addressing gender-based violence in academia, intersectionality acknowledges that gender-based violence can disproportionately impact individuals who hold multiple identities marked by multiple possible bases for oppression. So for instance, um, a woman of color or a queer person with health issues may face unique and compounded forms of gender-based gender violence and discrimination that need to be considered for ensuring an adequate response. So by considering intersectionality, we can better develop strategies and uh, that are inclusive, inclusive and equitable. So have that approach as we will uh, repeatedly discuss it later and in the next webinars. Now, in order to address gender-based violence in academia, UNICEF relies on the 7P framework, which takes a holistic approach to gender-based violence. The 7P, uh, uh, which you see in this diagram, are extending the, convention, uh, con the conventional United Nations and European, European Union's 3P approach, prevention, protection, prosecution, or the Council of Europe Instable Convention 7P approach, 
prevention, protection, persecution, and policies. This framework, uh, which we'll present, of course, in this series, includes, in addition, prevalence, partnerships, and provision of services. So let's now watch the conceptual framework video of UNICEF, which presents 7P approach and the definition of each P, and we'll get back to go deeper into the definitions and start with prevalence. I'm bringing up the video right now. For harassment in universities and Let's research organizations. UNICEF is an EU-funded project that studies gender-based violence and sexual harassment in universities and research organizations. This knowledge is then translated into operational tools for higher education and research organizations as well as policymakers. In UNICEF, we work with the 7P model to assess institutional responses to eradicate gender-based violence. This 7P model takes a holistic approach and is better equipped to collect comprehensive data, analyze measures, and translate findings into operational tools. The model extends two conventional approaches. The 3P model was developed by the United Nations and the European Union and includes prevention, protection and prosecution. The Council of Europe Istanbul Convention added policies, developing the 4P approach. To this, the UNICEF model adds three further Ps, prevalence, partnerships and provision of services. Policy is the basis of the approach and refers to both a coherent set of measures with a clear vision and strategy and specific policy documents detailing such measures. Prevalence and incidence estimates contribute to evidence-based policy making. Importantly, prevalence must take an intersectional approach, taking into account people's ethnicity and origin, gender identity, sexual orientation, as well as their function within the organization. Prevention refers to measures that promote changes in social and cultural behavior. In academia, this may include induction materials for both staff and students, internal and external publicity and training, and public statements and visuals. Protection aims at ensuring safety and meeting the needs of potential victims and survivors. This includes clear processes, procedures and infrastructure for reporting occurrences and supporting victims and survivors, along with training for those responsible for handling cases. Prosecution and disciplinary measures cover legal and disciplinary proceedings against perpetrators, along with related investigative measures and judicial proceedings. This includes possible warnings, suspension, rehabilitation, and termination of employment and study as legally appropriate and liaison with legal, police and criminal justice organizations and professionals. Provision of services refers to the services offered to support victims, families and perpetrators. In academia, this may include counseling as well as psychological and medical support. Importantly, the provision of services needs to be well known to all staff and students, as well as to managers and supervisors. Partnerships relate to the involvement of relevant actors at all levels, such as governmental agencies, civil society organizations, trade unions or staff and students associations. It's important to underline that measures can contribute to more than one P and the delineation between the P's is not always clear-cut. Find out more about UNICEF's research and outputs on the unicef-gbv.eu website. Right. So going back to our presentation, um, I will uh, briefly present again the definition of each P and then dive deeper into prevalence. 
as starting of the first webinar of this series. So starting with prevalence, it refers, as you may have heard, to data and data collection, estimating the extent of gender-based violence for different groups of people, and ideally providing information on different forms of gender-based violence. Prevention then refers to measures to promote changes in the social and cultural pattern of behavior and attitudes, of course, of all members of the institutional community. It addresses the culture and values of the organization and what it stands for. Protection measures aim to ensure the safety uh, that, that the safety and meet the needs of potential victims to avoid further harm. And uh, protection is it's decided on a case by case basis and include uh, clear procedures and infrastructure within the institution for reporting gender-based violence. Prosecution and disciplinary measures cover legal uh, proceedings against suspected uh, perpetrators and related investigative measures, including court cases, criminal and civil offenses, as well as internal disciplinary and grievance procedures. Provision of services refers to the services offered to support uh, victims and their families, perpetrators, by standards of gender-based violence, and other institutional community members who are affected by gender-based violence. Partnerships relate to the involvement of relevant, relevant actors at, at, all, uh, at all levels, such as governmental agencies, civil society organizations, service providers, and trade unions or staff and student associations. External partnerships complement the skills, competencies, and expertise available within the institution. Lastly, policies refer to policy frameworks, which are the existence of a coherent set of measures with a clear vision and comprehensive strategy that respond to the problems of gender-based violence in an integral and structural way. And policies also refer to policy documents, documents which are formalized explicitly and spe specifically the organization's commitment to fight gender-based violence. We will discuss each of these in the next webinars, starting today with prevalence. Asia. Yes, thank you, Panayota. I'm trying to change the slide. Yes. Okay, let's go back. <laughs> okay. Perfect. All right, perfect. Prevalence refers to data and data collection aimed at estimating the scale of the problem of gender-based violence for different groups of people and providing information on its different forms. Prevalence estimates can be collected through surveys, such as a questionnaire collecting information from a sample of respondents. Such questionnaires could ask about the presence or absence of certain behaviors which are defined and operationalized as violence, attitudes, or experiences related to gender-based violence. Another way of collecting such data is via the already established administrative data sources or by adding questions in existing institutional surveys, for example, surveys on, on staff or students' well-being, student satisfaction surveys, or course evaluations. If institutional data is not readily available, consider referring to existing data, such as uh, the UNICEF survey or other similar surveys. Remember that the lack of data shouldn't be a reason for not acting. Importantly, prevalence must take an intersectional approach, taking into account people's age, ethnicity and origin, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability status, as well as their functional status within the organization. For example, whether they are part of time or full time, have a temporary or permanent contract, are international students, PhD candidates, professors, and so on. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Uh, in case you are designing a survey on gender-based violence, always consider using existing and validated survey instruments, keeping the length of the survey manageable to encourage completion and a high, a high response rate. Collect only the data that you intend to analyze. Therefore, be critical when choosing questions uh, with open-ended answers. 
When you use phrases such as off and on the campus, make sure you provide clear definitions of such uh, terminology. When you describe different forms of gender-based violence, describe concrete situations instead of using a specific term, such as rape or sexual harassment, as many people who experience rape or sexual harassment do not identify their experiences with that specific term. Lastly, uh, use uh, inclusive language and uh, do not assume that all of the victims identify as a woman. Choose a person instead uh, in your survey design. Some do's, uh, uh, in, of course, in order, um, okay, some do's and don'ts on research ethics now. Uh, your survey is uh, designed and ready to be launched. When you share the survey, use internal channels uh, to control access in case it is an anonymous survey and to ensure that the respondents belong to your institution. Avoid sharing the survey link via social media platforms as you cannot know for sure whether the person is a member of your institution or not, if no institutional login is uh, required. Uh, in order to ensure high response rate, send weekly reminders and keep the survey access open to response for four weeks or longer. Victims of violence may decide to respond at a later phase not necessarily once the survey is disseminated. The dissemination of the results to the decision-making bodies is very important. By sharing the results with these groups, they can better understand the scope and severity of gender-based violence in academic contexts and use this information to develop interventions and policies to prevent and respond to uh, such violence. So, now we're moving on the, the practical do's and don'ts on research ethics. I'm sorry, but I'm managing the slides. Okay, perfect. Uh, remember to check whether ethics and any other type of approvals are necessary for an online gender-based violence survey and determine the information required for approval. Take a survivor-centered approach, a victim-centered approach to your online survey on gender-based violence and protect respondents from re-traumatization. You can do that by integrating a trigger warning in the informed consent form at the beginning and before asking sensitive questions on experiences with gender-based violence. Uh, you may also offer opt-out items with the prevalence questions and to provide information on available helplines throughout uh, the survey. Another important element is to indicate in the informed consent information on the purpose of data collection, survey content, data protection compliance, data management and storage, authorized access to information, contact details for the data protection officer, and study principal investigator and with tick boxes to give consent its time. Ensure anonymous participation and do not require registration by the respondents so that they feel uh, the survey and also they feel protected and safe. When presenting the results of the survey, avoid any re-identification risks by cross-checking whether information such as gender identity age and job title would make it possible to identify individual participants. In small institutions especially, this risk may be considerably higher, so you need to be careful about that. Uh, ensure GDPR compliance by defining the data usage as limited to the purpose outlined in the informed consent form. You can find more information on prevalence in the upcoming toolkit developed by UNICEF, which will be available in September 2023. Given the introduction on prevalence of our UNICEF toolkit, we will, can now move on to the first exchange of uh, experience with our guest speaker, Professor Anlor Hubert, 
uh, which is a professional and director of the Center for Diversity, Policy, Research and Practice at Oxford Brookes University, and also a partner in UNICEF project. I give the floor to my colleague Panagiotta now. Yes, thank you, Vasya. And welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. I will now bring on the slides. So today's exchange will be in the form of, let's say, an interview, and then open the floor uh, to uh, questions from the chat box uh, that are addressed by our audience. So Anne, uh, we'd like to start with the first question, since we heard all about its prevalence. Um, what are the first steps in preparing a survey on prevalence? Thank you, Pan. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, just to say that uh, I, I am here just wearing two hats because I will be talking in my capacity as a UNICEF consortium member and somebody that worked with uh, many others on the survey itself, but also sometimes uh, in relation to my experience in uh, my institution at Oxford Brookes University, because we implemented a prevalence survey, which was in fact the pilot of the UNICEF survey. So just I, I will just try and tell everybody when I'm just referring to our pilot survey from the point of view of our institution and when I'm referring more to the, the general UNICEF survey. Great, thank you for the clarification, of course. So just going back to, to your question, you, I think you asked me about the first steps in preparing a survey on prevalence. So here, it just, of course, it's just really, really important to think about the questionnaire that you're going to use. Your, your data is only going to be as good as the questions. So there are a lot of validated questionnaires that are available, a lot of international uh, tools that you can adapt or adopt. Uh, that have been pre-tested and piloted. So I would certainly recommend always to look uh, at those existing questionnaires and to see what you want to take from it. So apart from having validated questions, it's also a really good way to benchmark against uh, other institutions, for example. Uh, think about the support to uh, people that might be triggered uh, by the survey, so just uh, Vasya uh, talked about this a little bit, uh, making sure that you have opt-outs, that you provide uh, resources at different points in the questionnaire. So when you start asking, for example, about uh, whether somebody was subjected to an incident, make sure that they can click on a link somewhere to just be able to access help in their institution if they need to. Make sure that you get ethics approval. Uh, before you approach uh, anybody with the survey. Uh, and it's just really particularly important to a survey on gender-based violence because of the triggering potential that there is with the survey. I think on the more sort of logistic and methodological point, I just think about what communication strategy you're going to adopt to just disseminate the survey, to raise awareness of that and uh, just how you're going to do the sampling. The aim of having a survey is of course to have something that is as representative as possible. Uh, but what you want to do is you don't necessarily want to target the survey at victims only. If you want to measure prevalence, you want everybody in the institution to talk about their, uh, their experiences. And not having experiences is in itself something that's interesting. So we, we just need to have everybody's experiences in order to be able to calculate prevalence, risk, experiences, and better understand how to protect everybody. Uh, and then just maybe uh, a last point would be to keep in mind the overall objective of the survey. It's just very easy when you implement a survey to just not really see beyond the point in time when you're doing the survey and just to see the, the, the bigger picture. So for us at Oxford Brookes University, it was very much part of the gender equality plan that we were that we are still implementing. So just really part of that uh, structural change process in institutions. So just make sure that those results actually feed into actions uh, later on in, in time. Right, that was indeed a, a really important point. Thank you. And uh, moving on, what are the, let's say, main elements of a survey on prevalence? So here maybe I can talk a little bit more about the UNICEF survey itself rather than the, the pilot which we did at Oxford Brookes University, uh, just, just because they, uh, they are slightly different. We just reordered some of the questions and the results of the pilot, though essentially they, they are very similar. 
uh, the, the questionnaire of the UNICEF survey is, is, is uh, available, of course, uh, for you to just have a greater look in detail. But if I just go briefly through some of the headings and the, the, the elements that we asked about in the survey, uh, we started to ask uh, for social demographic information. And that's really, really important to have this because we had information about different aspects of uh, the uh, diversity, whether that's social demographic or functional of staff and students. And of course, that is fundamental later to be able to undertake an intersectional analysis. We uh, ask questions about the prevalence of gender-based violence, and here we follow international best practice, which is to ask about incidents rather than ask directly about violence. So to give you an example, we don't ask directly, have you experienced physical violence? Uh, we prefer to just ask, it's just, has somebody ever done this to you since you started at your institution and in the context of your institution? So for example, has somebody threatened to hurt you physically? Has somebody pushed or shoved you, slapped you, grabbed or pulled your hair, and so on. So that's just like very, very precise, uh, pr precise incidents. So that there is no room for interpretation that may be uh, different in different contexts or different understandings. Um, we also looked at follow-up questions in the UNICEF survey, and here we had to balance this with the, the requirements to make the, the survey as short as possible. So we asked about health, and so this is very important, the frequency at which uh, incidents of violence take place. We asked about information about the perpetrator, including the perceived gender of perpetrators and who they were. So whether they were, they were for example, colleagues, a supervisor, if they were another student, if, um, if they were a, a friend or a, 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 um, a partner, but again, always in the context of the institution. And of course, the location of the incident. Uh, we included a few questions about experiences of by, as bystanders and as perpetrators. Uh, and uh, we uh, looked at the prevalence across the, the six different forms of violence that are in the UNICEF project. So looking at uh, physical violence, psychological violence, economic violence, sexual violence, sexual harassment, and online violence. So just these questions would have been repeated just across those different forms of violence. Uh, we thought that looking at prevalence just could not be done without also looking at the consequences uh, of uh, gender-based violence. So we asked questions about this. We asked questions about, in particular, feeling socially excluded, uh, feeling unsafe, and feeling unwell, uh, but also questions related to possible work or study outcomes. So these were different for staff and students. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we asked uh, questions that were really related to the context of the organization that, that were more related to the 7P model uh, or to other aspects. So, for example, we, we included some questions about uh, gender essentials beliefs to try and capture a little bit uh, the norms. So, of course, this is a very, very brief overview of, uh, of a survey, which is actually itself quite comprehensive. So it just, it's certainly the, the for anybody that wants to implement a prevalence survey in their own institution, uh, I would say that just having a look at the UNICEF questionnaire just is a very, very good uh, starting point because yeah. of the comprehensiveness of what it has included. Great, thank you. Uh, we already added in the in the chat the survey. Um, and who or which body is advised to be responsible for the collection of this data? Anne? Well, I, I can give you my professional opinion on, on this and, and talk about our experience here. Uh, in our case at Oxford Brookes University, uh, this was done by our research center. So we are the Center for Diversity Policy Research and Practice. And there was an advantage in, in doing that. Uh, one was that uh, we have uh, certainly a lot of expertise in, in relation to gender-based violence and to structural change. Uh, but what was really important that uh, the uh, colleagues, uh, students necessarily didn't necessarily know us, but also that they just perceived us as being independent from the institution. 
However, we had a lot of links uh, with structural change efforts. So we are very much part of the implementation of action plans and the Athena Swan, the race equality charter and so on. So we also have a lot of institutional knowledge uh, from our organization. So it was just a very, very good combination to have something like this. So if I was going to make recommendations, again, very much my own professional opinion, I would say that it is always a good idea to partner up with an independent body. And that could be somebody that's internal, but if you do not have this, like, like we do in our institution, that could be external partners, or it could be both. And just to make sure that you just uh, have an implementation of survey with a team that has expertise, knowledge, and capability. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Anne. And um, who, oh, sorry, what, do we need to take into consideration when designing an intersectional survey? Such an interesting question. And I, I've been working a lot uh, recently on the measurement uh, of intersectionality from a quantitative point of view, which is uh, just, of course, uh, uh, full, of, full of tensions. So a starting point is just to uh, embed intersectionality into a survey is to, of course, measure different categories. And that is contentious, uh, but it's just because you don't want to overstabilize categories. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you just need to have, uh, if you want to call them heuristic devices, to just be able to say something about uh, potential uh, different groups. So having uh, measuring is the first step. So you can have categories, for example, certainly around age, uh, make sure that you have sex, gender identity, trans status, sexual orientation, disability, chronic illness, ethnic origin, and so on. So just this is just not an exhaustive list, but it's just mm -hmm. the first step I, I will stress is, of course, measurement. Um, but it's also really, really important to ensure that it's not only about uh, putting people into boxes in the first place to that measurement, but make sure that intersectionality is really something that is integral, absolutely integral to the survey itself. So not only focusing on the breakdowns in each subcategory, uh, but having an analysis that seeks to challenge relations of power and privilege within our institutions. So to give you an example of what we have been doing in the UNICEF analysis, so just in, in using the survey data, is that we have been using uh, an analytical method that go beyond just using descriptive results, and we have been using intersectional multi-level modeling, uh, which is essentially uh, saying that individuals are not independent of each other, uh, but are very likely to share similar experiences to others. Uh, around uh, just the same intersectional uh, identities. So not, not having necessarily unity within those categories, but certainly some similarities and overlap in, in the experiences that they may have around gender-based violence. Absolutely. Thanks, Anna. And um, what, let's say, are the necessary resources, budgets, personnel, or expertise in order to conduct uh, such survey? What would you say? from your experience? I think certainly you need people that have expertise, uh, but you really need to talk about how they're going to be rewarded for their contribution. Too often, we have agents within institutions that are expected to do equality work and then just do it for free on top of their job. So it, just, yeah. it, it needs to be discussed and cleared with institutions. Uh, you need to make sure that you have expertise. So just like it's sometimes useful to do an internal assessment of the expertise that there is uh, and just to identify what is there and where you might seek external collaborations where you need uh, additional uh, expertise. And of course, with the budget uh, now, thankfully, just with online surveys, it just we don't need a lot. Uh, just surveys are no longer very expensive, but mm -hmm. you might need budget uh, for other activities. So that would be to engage expertise. If you have external actors, it could be to provide incentives. If you if you decide to do this, then you say a survey. We we chose not to, but uh, it uh, remains an option. Uh, and of course, to reward the contribution of uh, any experts internally that would contribute to that. Of course. Of course. And, <clears throat> excuse me, can you mention some good practices in promoting the survey so that we get more responses 
are the social media a good practice? Well, certainly any way of publicizing the survey, raising awareness of that is, is very welcome. And there are a number of different ways to do this. It could be putting it on the, um, on the posters or on the advertisement boards within campuses if you're dealing with universities. But social media is uh, also something that is just uh, very, very powerful. The only thing that I would say is just make sure you do not put the links on your social media uh, because then you do not control uh, who the respondents are, and you want to ensure that the respondents belong to the institutions. Of course. So the the for example in the UNICEF uh, survey, uh, both, both the main survey and the one we did at Oxford Brookes University, we uh, adopted a quasi census method. So it means that uh, we wanted to target uh, institutional. So target people and just invite them to participate via their institutional email address to uh, just, uh, and that's what we use for the first invitation and all mm -hmm. the reminders afterwards. And in fact, uh, at uh, Oxford Brookes University, uh, just because of the policy of the university, we did not get permission to send an email to everybody. It's forbidden for anybody, even for a survey like this uh, that was uh, endorsed by the senior uh, leadership. Uh, so what we did is that we communicated uh, the survey and, and provided the link on the intranet uh, and promoted this via institutional communications that were centralized. And uh, unfortunately, just that generated probably a lower response rate that we might have had Mm -hmm. uh, if we had been allowed to just send it to all institutional email addresses. Interesting, yeah. Um, and do you have any, um, before moving to the recommendations, let's say, let's focus on internal stakeholders. How can internal stakeholders, uh, staff, student, or departments in general be mobilized to promote such a service, given that, for example, in your case, you were not ab able to, to disseminate to the whole university, let's say? So as I said, we we had uh, secured the commitment of the senior leadership. That was part of the implementation of our gender equality plan. So uh, we had two of the, the two of the most senior women in our institution that just uh, sent the invitation in their name uh, uh, to participate in the survey. So just that public uh, endorsement of the survey was just hugely hugely beneficial and really set, set the tone for how important it was. Uh, but we also have to mobilize the survey, we, we have other actors within the university. Uh, in particular, we have a number of very active campaign around uh, psychological violence and harassment. And we have, uh, for example, for a long time, for a few years now, uh, it's not okay, it's not Brooks campaign that is just uh, looking at uh, uh, at raising awareness around the problem of uh, harassment in institutions. So just a lot of people at all levels with uh, student services, with staff were just engaged in that and just were mobilized also in promoting the surveys. Uh, and then, of course, what we have, and that's just something that is more recent, is that we have a, also a more bottom-up and expert approach that is coming uh, with now a working group uh, on gender-based violence in the institution that comes from just different academics, but also professional services engaged with that, that are just organizing and mobilizing just around different resources. So that was good for the survey, uh, but it also means that we are now talking about the results of the survey and talking about how we can embed that into some of the prevention programs uh, that we have. So we have a consent uh, education program that has been introduced a couple of years ago that is just now being rolled out and being made mandatory for, for new students. So it's just becoming part uh, of of uh, further actions and, uh, and measures with the institutions. So how, how the internal stakeholders are being mobilized, but for us, it's still something that's relatively um, organic, if I can put it like this, but you can see how it's becoming more systematized and institutionalized already. Excellent. And now thinking ahead and thinking of the results, do you have any recommendations regarding the communication of the survey results, which I think is one of the most important parts? I would like then to go back to intersectionality, uh, just like make sure that you provide uh, 
results that just talk about the experiences of people not only just conflating gender-based violence with violence against women, but really talk about the experiences across different gender identity groups. And certainly in the results of the UNICEF survey, we see that the group that is most at risk are uh, people that uh, identify as non-binary, for example. Uh, so in, in this, it just to try and be as granular as possible in the reporting uh, that you do, but at the same time, making sure that you protect uh, people's identities and that uh, you, you just don't disclose uh, just by uh, having cell counts that are too small. I think I would like to stress how um, engaging in a dialogue with different actors about the results, just how, how important that is. Uh, and that is a different level. So just particularly at senior leadership, uh, so that uh, it just they, they, these uh, results are translated into actions. So it's not it's not enough to just be able to talk about the results. Just like if nothing is going to happen as a result of that, and then just. As a more general point, I would say just like it's so important to give back to the community. I mean, we are privileged that uh, people share the, their experiences uh, with us within the survey. So just I really see it as a, as a duty, as a responsibility for us uh, to share the results. And that could be internally, that could be externally, uh, including into the EDI reports that the institutions might make or uh, indeed into any other uh, measures that they might uh, implement. Yes, indeed, that's so important. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Anne, for this insightful conversation and interview. Uh, we would like now to open the floor uh, to questions uh, from our audience. We already have some in the chat, chat and I will start addressing these. Um, so please feel free to ask any questions, uh, either focused before on what we discussed at the first part or on Anne's um, discussion right now. Um, so the first question, uh, is studying gender-based violence prevalence really worth investing on? Isn't what we isn't that we know already enough? Um, I think that we need to focus to invest in studying prevalence, but rather, uh, in sorry, I think I, I don't think that we need to invest in studying prevalence, but rather in remaining peace. So, and what, what do you think on that? So the last part, rather invest on? Uh, I don't think we need to invest in studying prevalence, but rather they're in the remaining peace, prevention, um, protection, the rest of the peace. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, I think the two are linked. Absolutely. It's just, it's a... Uh, Understanding prevalence is a first step. Having having the data that gives you the evidence is absolutely fundamental to just being able to respond to the problem. What we have is just very often is we don't have a true understanding of the scale of, of the problem. And I, I have myself worked on prevalence surveys of gender-based violence for uh, quite a number of years, uh, but not in the context of academia. Before and uh, I, when I saw the, the, the results of the survey, I was, I, I don't want to say I was surprised because actually I wasn't so surprised, but it just like even, even I just, well, yeah, actually, just like we, we, we really, really have a, a huge problem. Uh, so I, I would say just that we have to also regard prevalence uh, in, in a nuanced way. Measuring prevalence is something that is ex extremely difficult because the interpretation of prevalence is not straightforward. What you don't know is if you have prevalence, it, whether it means it's a good or a bad thing. So of course, what we want, if we want to eradicate violence, our goal should be to have a prevalence of zero. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if we have higher prevalence, it could also be a positive thing because it would mean it could it could be interpreted as having institutions that are putting into place measures that create this culture where it is okay to to report, where it is okay to disclose, where people feel that they can trust the institution, okay. they have confidence in the institution to just be able to respond to that. So prevalence in itself is not everything. But it's it's a very 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 important starting point. Maybe mm -hmm. a last point on this is just to here we're talking about prevalence in the form of a survey, but there are other ways in which to uh, obtain data 
about this and just and this is true uh, administrative records within the institutions which will provide uh, slightly different information because that will just provide information about the reported cases typically so another very good practice is to not only rely on prevalence coming from from surveys but also to combine that with administrative data uh, that also tells you about uh, what is uh, happening in just in your institution Good. Thanks for this. Um, we have another question. Uh, do you collect des testimonies from perpetrators or people who admit having committed gender-based violence or only victims and regular people? So the, the survey that we did, both surveys, the, the one I did in the institution and the, the UNICEF survey, ask follow-up questions and ask just, have you ever done this to somebody? So we have some information. Uh, about uh, people that identify as perpetrators within the survey itself we don't uh, we, we don't collect testimonies as such uh, but that there are other parts of the project uh, where there have been interviews that uh, have been uh, collected and just uh, I, I know that um, my colleague for, for example that coordinated uh, this work Vilana Pelinkati is on this course so just uh, and there is a, a report uh, that may be out already so if it is out maybe Vilana would kindly just uh, post the link uh, in the chat excellent um we have another question well comment and question very interesting is the UNICEF survey questionnaire available in English only I I um, it's uh, it's been translated into, if I'm correct, fourteen languages, fourteen mm -hmm. different uh, languages. Uh, I, again, it's just I, I uh, assume that uh, some of those translations are already available or will soon uh, be made available. Great. Um, if I haven't missed any other question, I don't see anything else uh, in the chat. Perhaps. Um, we can ask some questions that we, uh, if anyone else wants to, to, to write their questions, feel free, free, please feel free to address them in the chat. But since we have some more time, um, I wanted to ask you, Anne, um, how, let's say, let's be more, let's say, practical. How can the survey results be used to drive institutional change? You mentioned um, to have this. And engage dialogue with the senior leadership, but from your experience um, at, at Oxford Brooks, how have you utilized those data? Um, well, one of the first thing we did is once we, we got the results is we wrote an institutional uh, report, uh, which was shared with the, the, the senior leadership team in our institution. And then we presented the results at uh, senior committees. So we, we have uh, different committees, uh, again, chaired by uh, one by our vice chancellor uh, and others by some of the pro vice chancellors. Uh, so that the, these were presented there. Uh, we are presenting these results also to other key uh, actors within our institutions. So uh, just to uh, cite some people that are just very, very influential for doing this kind of work would be our, our chief people officer, uh, but also just representative uh, from uh, staff and student groups in particular trade unions and so on. So it's just really used as evidence here to, to, to see just the, the extent of the problem uh, itself. Um, I have to say that it's, uh, it's a bit of a, a long journey because we did the uh, pilot survey in Oxford Brooks University uh, in, uh, I'm, I'm confused with the dates now, we, we just did it, uh, so we did in, in uh, last year, so in uh, the autumn of 2021, so two years ago, yes, two years ago, so it's just like this, it just, uh, by the time the, the data were processed and analyzed and so on, it just, it takes, takes a little bit of time, so it's just still finding its way. So it just would be a mistake to just think that uh, you do a prevalent survey and it's just a, a magic bullet and uh, it just suddenly changes absolutely everything in the organization. Yeah. But certainly for us, it has opened up a lot of conversations around what was happening 
uh, in terms of uh, particularly psychological violence and how prevalent it was around sexual violence, about the fact that there were some very, very marked differences mm -hmm. between the experiences of, of staff and students as well. Indeed. Thank you so much for this. And can you perhaps elaborate a bit further on administrative data? What do we mean by that? Or perhaps give more concrete examples on how this can be utilized? So administrative data would be typically just records that are being kept by the institution, just uh, as to the number of cases uh, that uh, they had to handle. It's uh, uh, sometimes it's just like having, but in a way that protects the identities of both victims and perpetrators, the outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, these cases, uh, but also information just for that allow for an intersectional perspective, just trying to break down it just what was it staff, students, what was the gender identity of the uh, parties involved, uh, what was the context, uh, and so on. And just to make sure that this this is being discussed uh, internally and uh, and also just like if possible, and just that it would be a good uh, good practice to just also so make that transparent, for example, by putting it into EDI reporting. And let's say in the cases that the response rate is low, how are these results being assessed? What is their value, let's say? So a low response rate is not necessarily something that is problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really, really important from a statistical point of view is to talk about representativeness. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you have if you have a low response rate for a sample that is uh, representative, it's just like you you don't have any problems. And indeed, we see now, just mm -hmm. it's very very typical for surveys to have a twenty to uh, a ten to twenty percent rate, and even that now is considered something that is very good. So, I wouldn't let anybody dismiss. Um, your survey on the basis that it has a low response rate. What uh, you need to do is to demonstrate that it is representative and there are ways to show this. Um, a starting point is to compare the sample characteristics, so the, the characteristics of your respondents compared to uh, the characteristics of, uh, of your institution. So if that was for the population, for example, we would expect to have approximately a split of 50% women, 50% men, uh, because we don't have information about other gender identities. But if we have something that is greatly different from that, it just, uh, it, it would uh, signal that some, something is going on. In the institution, we, in um, the UNICEF surveys, what we have done is we have compared that to other types of administrative data, but we asked institution to tell us about some key characteristics. So we asked for the number of, uh, uh, of women and men in the institution. We asked for the number of students, uh, number of staff and so on. And what we did, but it's just like, I mean, that's the next step is uh, we, uh, and that's something that's very often done for, for surveys is we calculated some weights. So we re-weighted the results to just make it more representative. And so how, bit, uh, sorry, please. Uh, no, go uh, ahead. I wanted to, since you mentioned that, how often would you advise to repeat such survey in an institution? Uh, I think there is no consensus really uh, as to when you should be doing this. Um, you don't want to repeat it too often because uh, there is a lot of uh, survey fatigue in institutions. Uh, at the same time, you want to repeat it often enough uh, that uh, you, you will be able to see uh, changes over time. And also you need to think about, this is very, very specific to the context of uh, universities. It's just because when we have uh, students in universities, typically, uh, their uh, institutional lifetime, if I can put it like this, is going to be about three years. It's just like it's really a, a feature of university. Students students come in, and they they will go out again. So it's just like I mean, within 
within a, a number of years, it's just like you have a, a near total renewal of the population. So mm -hmm. you would yeah. want to just capture that uh, at, at different points. What doesn't change or what we want to change is probably the culture of the institution. So even though just like our students, just like, I mean, might be uh, might be leaving and just uh, we have different generations mm -hmm. of students coming in just what we want to affect is the culture of the institutions that doesn't tolerate uh, just that that kind of uh, these kinds of behaviors and actually puts into place effective measures uh, to to tackle it when it arises great thank you so much Anne, for this uh, insightful uh, conversation uh, if we don't have any other questions uh, from our audience uh, i think i haven't missed anything from the chat then I will give my uh, the to uh, Vasya to end this uh, insightful webinar. Still, uh, since we have time, if yes. you have more questions, uh, you can type them in the chat. Yeah, if there is like a, a last encouragement if people want more, yes. but they can always, of course, contact us uh, anytime via email. There is one more question in the chat that came now. Yes, I think we can address it if, if Anne is okay. okay. We can already address it if Anne, you are okay with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is how do you manage vicarious trauma face-to-face -face survey results? So, Anne, if you have some time. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just going to rephrase the, the question slightly to just ensure that I, I understand it because um, what I, I understand as vicarious trauma, and the, please for the, the person that asked the question is just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just really related to uh, what happens to uh, so I, I've heard it used in the context, for example, of health practitioners, of uh, doctors, so just like or people that are engaged in the, uh, in the conflicts. Uh, it's just like a, and how we uh, actually suffer ourselves from engagement with the uh, with just research on gender based violence or just dealing with people. Is is that do I understand that correctly? As the what the question is. If the participant that asked this question can clarify in the chat, that will be much appreciated. Or at least I, I will try and answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think, yeah I'll answer that question in my interpretation. I hope that yeah. uh, that's what is meant. Uh, I, I think it's just for anybody that deals with gender-based violence, it just it is something that is just very, very real and mm -hmm. something that is just very complicated to negotiate uh, as uh, I can talk about my experience, maybe just uh, as just, for example, reading about gender-based violence is something that I, I sometimes find difficult. And indeed, uh, just like I, I have had informal support conversations with the other colleagues sometimes, so just sharing our experiences around that. Um, what we find, and just uh, it's not necessarily about myself or others, but it just may be an observation which is not based on a, on a very good uh, sampling strategy. But uh, I have found that sometimes people that engage with gender based violence do so uh, because of their own personal experiences. It's just like sometimes it just there is no accident for why people are interested in fighting this, and it's just like sometimes it just there is that potential for re-traumatization of ourselves because it just echoes some experiences that that we may have you know just even even when those experiences are not and i don't want to say some experiences are more serious than others but it's just like even when we just do not necessarily have uh, incidents that are extremely traumatic it's just like it's sometimes difficult to 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 maintain those boundaries uh, so what I, I would just say, it's just like, how do you negotiate that? It's just, well, yeah, this is my own strategy is just sometimes to just have a have a conversation with a colleague and just kind of share those experiences and, and offload. But I know also uh, of uh, colleagues that have uh, made use of uh, the um, 
ancillary services within institutions, a, a bit like uh, cancelers themselves would have access to cancelling themselves to process just what they have. It just sometimes it's just useful to, to, to just seek support within the institution. It just if it is needed or just uh, as a as a even even just as a sort of a mental health check to just ensure that you just do not take too much uh, on yourself. No, I'm, I'm not sure that I, I can just answer much more uh, that, than that on this, other than just from my limited uh, kind of experience dealing with that. Since there are no more questions in the chat box, thank you very much for attending the first webinar. This is a series, as we said, so we'll look forward to seeing you in the next. Uh, the second part on the 25th of April will be about prevention, protection and prosecution. And the third one will be on provision of services.